talking from the book of 1 Corinthians. And if you want to turn there again this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We started reading in the 20th verse of where the Apostle Paul was giving instruction on how to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, the people at Corinth was doing it wrongly. They were doing it as a festive, a feast, in other words, atmosphere. And in fact, it had very little to do with what the Lord's Supper communion is all about. So Paul rebuked them for the way they were doing it. And we've gotten down to actually the 29th verse last week. Kind of a recap here in verse 27. He writes, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord uh, unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, that is strong warning. It's something that should never be taken lightly. Uh, but he says in verse 28, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. For he who eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, with that kind of strict warning, you might think, well, should I even partake of communion table? Should, should I... Uh, not take a chance on it. Well, no, you should partake because the Bible says uh, in verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till He comes. So we are doing it by faith. We receive it, the elements of the communion table, we receive them by faith. And we are showing something. We are acknowledging, we are honoring God when we do those things the right way, or you could say the worthy way. So it behooves every one of us to learn how to do it right. Now I want to make this statement that sometimes we can build up a doctrine off of something and, and we think, well, I will never attain that level. You ever been there? Some people will make Christianity so hard and so difficult that nobody can live by it. Now, I don't think that's the way it was intended to be. But we do have certain requirements and standards that we need to measure up to as Christians or we could pay a, a terrible price for it. We have to be aware and the word guilty means what it says. Guilty if you don't do it right. Amen? And we don't want to be there. But anyway, being worthy, and that's what he's talking about here. We need to be worthy to receive this. So being worthy does not, emphasis on the word not, does not mean a person has no problems or any weaknesses in life. Hmm. You know, it's just like some people uh, will tell somebody if they get saved, now you're saved, but you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. And they'll lay down a, a strong regiment of things and standards that that person needs to measure up to before they can get the Holy Ghost. See, I, I don't think it, it's meant to be that way. Do you? No. Because if you could do it all without the Holy Ghost, why would you need Him? Right? No. We need Him to help us to be able to be an overcomer. 
So yeah, you go ahead by faith and you receive everything God has for you and that will help put you over in life. You will have problems. I know of people that's been saved many, many years and they still have problems in their Christian life. Me being one of them. Weaknesses. We have our weaknesses, don't we? So, yeah, don't think you have to attain perfection before you qualify to receive from what God has for us to partake of, especially here in the communion service. Here is one thing. You may fall short. As the Apostle Paul said, I have not attained, neither have I reached perfection, but this one thing I do, I press on to the things of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The one thing that we need to make sure of when we receive the communion table is our heart needs to be right with God and our fellow man. If it's not, then you're putting yourself in the classification here of being unworthy and you can eat and drink damnation to yourself under those situations. Now, the heart or the spirit of man is something that only God can deal with, right? Now, I was thinking of some of the men and and characters in the Bible that uh, were mightily used of God. We can think of King David for an example. How God used him as the king of Israel. And uh, in the book of Acts chapter 13 verse 22 it tells us that uh, they were talking uh, uh, Luke writing there about uh, you know the lineage of Jesse and and David being uh, the son of Jesse and and how that David was a man after God's own heart. Think about it. A man after God's own heart. Now you say, well, did David attain some kind of super spiritual level to be that? No, David sinned. Different times. He did things wrong. You know, you could say he sinned royally. He sinned as a king, even. He did a lot of things that he should not have done. But here's the thing about David, and the reason they can say that about the heart of David. David was quick to repent. He was quick to get back into fellowship with his Lord. And he acknowledged his shortcomings. And that's the reason the Bible can say he was after the heart of God. He was like a, a, a deer that runneth and panteth after, after God. Amen? He was thirsty for, uh, hungry for the things of God. Well, I'll tell you what, then that puts you in pretty good standing, right? We, we find in, in the uh, Gospel of St. Luke, Chapter 6 where Jesus was talking uh, about a, a tree and fruit in somebody's life. And, and he said a good tree brings forth uh, good fruit. A corrupt tree uh, brings forth corrupt fruit. And every tree is known by his own fruit. Then he said in verse 45, he said a good man. Out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. So where does good things come from? Out of the heart of man. But he says an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is evil. Now people can claim whatever they want to claim, in, uh, about themselves in their lives. But let me tell you something. Good trees bring forth good fruit. Evil trees bring forth. And it's a thing of the heart. It's not an outward display or something of that nature. <coughs> so anyway. Uh, 
In the book of Samuel, chapter 1, verse 16, uh, the Lord is, is talking to the prophet and, and uh, explaining to him that he's turned uh, away from Saul. You know, Saul, first king of Israel. But he is telling the prophet Samuel, I want you to go to the house of Jesse and, uh, you know, of his sons is, is my choice for the next king of Israel. So Samuel did that and, and uh, he went into the house of Jesse and I, here come one of his sons, Eliab, I believe it was, came up to him, probably tall, handsome, looked like a king. And Saul was, or Samuel was thinking, I'm going to anoint him to be, but God said, no, no, he's not the one. But he kind of looks like a king, you know? And uh, the Lord explained to Samuel that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Amen? On the heart of man. God can see the heart. You may not be able to see what's in somebody else's heart. God can and He does. So as the sons went by, God said, not him, not him. And then we know the story of how uh, he asked Jesse, do you have any more? Yeah, I have this shepherd boy out here. Go get him. And by the way, that was David. He became king of Israel. Beautiful story, right? So here's the thing. As God looks on the heart and can see the heart of man, we must remove those things that applies to our scripture here about the Lord's Supper. We must remove those things from our lives that are not pleasing to God. Remember the scripture we looked at over there in, in chapter 5 of where Paul was saying, you know, if you have leaven in your life, you need to get the leaven out. Amen? We need to be unleavened. Because leaven is a, is a type of sin, Right? So, uh, David being one example here of how God can use people that, well, seemingly has faults and problems like most of us do. Now, uh, another example would be uh, Moses. Go with me, if you would, to the book of Exodus. And we, we look here, in, actually in verse 2 of the book of Exodus, uh, Moses, in verse 5, it tells us in his earlier years of what he was like as a child. And, and, uh, and then uh, in verse 11, it says, And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burden. Uh, and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew. That was one of his brethren. And here's what Moses did. He looked this way and he looked that way. And he saw that there was no man. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Wow. Now, you might think, now, Moses, how, how, what brought you to this? Well, I, I'm telling you, Moses was in the flesh when he killed the Egyptian, okay? Because God didn't say kill him. Moses did. But, but if you go into chapter 3 here, you're going to see where verse 1 says, Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, uh, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even unto Oreb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. I tell you what, I, I believe Moses spent those 40 years in, on the, as we say, the backside of the desert to be taught um, a lesson, to humble himself in regard to the flesh. Oh, that's a long, hard lesson, isn't it? Wow. But anyway, uh, he was being just a shepherd boy. 
But he looked at this burning bush. He looked and behold the bush burned with fire. But the bush was not consumed. And Moses said I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he saw Moses turned aside to see the uh, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Verse 5. And God said, Draw not near hither. Uh, put off your shoes from off your feet, for the place whereon you stand is holy ground. And, and the Lord said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, you know what most of us would have been thinking right there? And Moses may have been thinking it too. The Bible doesn't say, boy, after all these years, God has appeared to me. And I tell you what, I'm going to get what's coming to me. God's going to get me now. You know, what for? Killing that Egyptian. You know, God didn't say one word to Moses about killing that Egyptian. Isn't that something? Huh. God knew in Moses, He had a meek, mannered man. In fact, the Bible says in the book of Numbers that meek, Joseph, or Moses was meek above all of the other people on the face of the earth. Meekness. What is meekness? Well, it has been described as strength under control. Meekness does not mean weakness. It has actually strength. It has to do with being submissive, right? Did you know that Jesus is described as being meek and lowly in heart? Right? Think about it. Meekness is also a fruit of the Spirit. Mentioned in the book of Galatians. And another thing too, did you know that the meek shall inherit this earth? So God knew that in Moses, He had a man, even though He allowed the flesh to work against Him, He had a man here that He knew would be uh, submissive to Him and do His will. Amen? So, example of God working with us for an ultimate purpose in our lives. But it's a condition of the heart. If Moses was a rebellious, stubborn, stubborn as the opposite of being meek, stubborn person that God could not work with, he might have said, Moses, you remember that Egyptian? <laughs> Amen. It is important, church, for us to keep our hearts right before God and keep the right kind of a spirit in us. Amen. Go with me, if you would, to the book of uh, Second Chronicles. And I, I want us to look at chapter 30. Second Chronicles, I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 29, we will also look at chapter 30. But we'll start in chapter 29 <coughs> and verse 20. Now, Israel had been a nation that had strayed away from God. Hezekiah, who was a godly king, uh, had been put into power in Israel. Here's the thing that Hezekiah did. He restored temple worship. I want to follow this because this leads up to actually the Passover. Hezekiah rose up, says in verse 20, early, gathered the rulers of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. He brought uh, the sacrifices. We won't go into all of them, but he, he killed the sacrifice. He sprinkled the blood upon the altar. And uh, he was restoring everything that God had told them uh, even back you know, the tabernacle in the wilderness and all of this. 
Hezekiah was restoring these things. Now, notice something here. As it says in, uh, uh, in verse 34 of chapter 29, it says, But the priests were too few, so that they could not flay, that is, prepare properly. This is good news for us, so learn a lesson here. All of the burnt offerings, wherefore their brethren, the Levites, did help them till the work was ended, and till the other priests had sanctified themselves. For the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. There was duties that needed to be done in restoring the temple worship. And by the way, they were kindly caught off guard. They, they were trying to get people together. They were trying to make it happen. All right, let's go on to chapter 30 here. This is talking about preparing for the Passover. If they prepared for the Passover back in those days, and they did, it was very important. Uh, feast, wasn't it? Now, everything that the Jews did concerning Passover had to be done at a specific time and a specific way. You didn't cut corners on it. Hmm? No. You had to do it right on time. You had to do it uh, ceremonially proper. Okay. Verse 1. Chapter 30, Hezekiah sent to all of Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. I'm going to tell you something right there, church. That Passover that they were partaking of was a type of the Calvary that we have today. I'm talking direct connection. You can read it over there in Exodus chapter 12. Saying the same thing. The Passover and all that was instituted back then. We're looking at Calvary. We're looking at that blood that Jesus shed. And the Bible says the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month, the appointed season. They were trying to do it according to the law. Amen. But they couldn't get all these things done. Somebody said, well, do we just forget it then? Just don't try to do it at all. No, that's not, uh, <laughs> that's not the thing that we need to do here. Okay? Now, they couldn't keep it. They couldn't get it together. Verse 4, the uh, the thing pleased the king and, and uh, they gathered themselves together and that pleased uh, Hezekiah the king. So notice verse 5. So they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even to Dan that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not done it of a long time and such sort as it was written. I don't know how long between keeping the Passover, but apparently it was a long time according to the Word of God. Now, here is something that King Hezekiah heard from the Lord for this Passover. Notice verse 7. He said, Be not like your fathers and like your brethren, which trespassed against the Lord God of your fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation as you see. Not, now, be not stiff-necked hmm, as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into His sanctuary, which He has sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of His wrath. I mean, those that knew the law and not doing it according 
There too, we could be under the wrath of God, but Hezekiah was offering a remedy. He was offering something to get rid of your stiff-neckedness. Uh, don't trespass against the laws and things of God. Amen? And, and do it the sanctified way. Wrath can be turned around when somebody repents. Hallelujah. Amen. That's good to know. Amen? Amen. Now, we go on down here, uh, down in verse 15, same chapter. Levites were uh, ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought in the burnt offering into the house of the Lord. And they stood in their place after their manner, according to the law of Moses, the man of God, the priests sprinkled the blood which they had received of the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the congregation who were not sanctified. Therefore the Levites had the charge of killing of the Passover. Uh, Passover. Uh, for everyone who was not clean to sanctify themselves unto the Lord. So in verse 18 it says the people cleansed themselves. Then they eat the Passover as it was written. But notice here, Hezekiah knew that things were not being done exactly according to protocol. Notice, the Bible says he prayed for them. Boy. I, I, I wish we had more leaders in our land today praying for us. Amen? He prayed for them, saying, the good Lord pardon everyone. <laughs> Don't you love the heart of Hezekiah right there? Amen? Somebody said, well, I don't have everything quite in order. That's just like somebody said, well, when I get everything figured out, I'll get saved. You're never going to get it figured out. Right? You're not. Notice here. Here's what Hezekiah. He says, it is the Lord that part prepares his heart to seek God. The Lord God of his Father. Though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. Wow. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah. Wow. And he did what? He healed the people. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. What a lesson. For us to know how to take and observe the Lord's Supper the right way. I got something for you this morning. Hezekiah prayed for the people, and God heard his prayer. How many knows who's praying for us every time we take communion? You know who it is? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. Ever living to make intercession for you and for me. None other than Jesus Christ is praying for us. Amen. If Hezekiah can get a prayer answered, I know Jesus can. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Now, they need to move on. Okay. Uh, back to... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want us to notice again here in verse 29. For if we do it unworthily, we eat and drink damnation to ourselves, not discerning the Lord's body. Boy, that's great emphasis. I mean, he spells it out. You're not discerning. You're not understanding the Lord's body and you are becoming a reproach. You know. You're, you're counting maybe his blood as an unworthy thing, and that's one of the most dangerous things you can do. Amen. Amen. Tread, tread, trod underfoot the blood of Jesus. <clears throat> I tell you what, you have no other sacrifice once you've done that. You're done, right? 
So we are discerning the Lord's body. He made mention here in verse 30, for this cause, he said, the cause of what? Not discerning the Lord's body. He said many, I think that would indicate a considerable number, right? Many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That means it's, it's different things. A person gets weak, they get sickly, and sleep means they die. So you get weak, sick, die. So uh, he's saying that was happening in the church at Corinth. We don't want it happening at the church at Loma, right? We want to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Okay. Now, he said in verse 31, we are to judge ourselves, judge ourselves that we should not be judged. Uh, we judge ourselves. Now, be, be ready when you judge yourself. If God wants to chasten you with His Word, let Him. Amen? Don't be stubborn and rebellious. Let Him. That we should not be condemned with the world. Now, if we will do those things, we can take the Lord's Supper that Jesus Himself instituted the night that He was betrayed by Judas, right? He had, he had bread, He had wine with His disciples. We can take the Lord's Supper and we can make it a blessing in our lives. And I want to say this before I close and we receive the elements. Let's go back to the seven ways that Jesus bled for us. Seven places, right? Okay. As I briefly mention these again, I want you to take these to heart because if we will do that, we are discerning the Lord's body. But if you do not know and you do not hear what Jesus did for you on the cross and how He bled, you are not discerning the Lord's body. Plain and simple, isn't it? You're just going through a religious activity. But here it is. We know in the start of it, in the Garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus, His sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood. Now, that was a process that took place because of the agony that he was facing. This is what that bloodshed will redeem us for or from today. It is a place, Gethsemane is a place of surrender and it's also a place of obedience. If you have problems with that, remember what Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane for you. But here's another thing that I believe every one of us can identify with. What He did there in the garden by shedding some blood, He has given us our willpower to resist temptation. Amen? I don't care. I've heard mature Christians say, Oh, I tell you what, I thought I was above temptation and boy, it hit me. Yeah, we all are faced with that church. Keep in mind that Jesus' body did that so we could resist the temptation of the devil. The next place, Jesus shed His blood. They took Him to the whipping post, right? They scourged Him. They beat Him with stripes on his back. Now that was for our healing. I, I want to point something out right there. Everything that Jesus did from the first place to the last place he shed his blood was for our healing. Some, some of it was spiritual healing. Some of it was mental healing. But here, I believe we can specifically say, according to the book of Isaiah, Chapter 53, this was for our physical healing. The stripes on his back.
bought our physical healing. Do we understand that? Do we discern that from the Word of God? We need to. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our own, his own sin, our own sins in his body, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we were, Calvary, we were what? Healed. Amen. When you get a, uh, uh, an understanding of that, you are discerning physical healing that Jesus bought and paid for. The crown of thorns that they put him in mockery upon his head. That restored our authority. And I'll tell you what, Christians, we need to understand the authority of the believer today as much as we ever have. You believe authority is given to the believer? It's in the Word. Amen? And also that crown of thorns, I believe, give you peace of mind. Oh, couldn't that be put to good use right now? Peace of mind. Amen? The next place we read about, He was bruised for our iniquities. Right? Did you know those hidden, so to speak, sins of the heart are not hidden to God? And those hidden, Hidden sins. Those things that maybe you don't even fully understand what's going on. But they can be sins of iniquity. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement of our peace was upon Him. Anyway, those sins can be washed away. Because Jesus was bruised. Inward bleeding. The hands... The hands. The Bible tells us we are to take our hands and use them to work righteousness. The Bible tells us places of where people have used their hands as works of unrighteousness, the works of evil. Yeah, people have done that. They've used the hands to kill people and, and a lot of things. It's murder. But anyway, we are to have our hands sanctified to the work of the Lord. The feet. Amen. We walk by faith. Hallelujah. We walk by faith. And not by sight. And when we walk, I believe we need to learn how to walk in dominion. Amen. That's why Jesus' feet was pierced. You know why he tell Joshua, wherever the sole of your feet goes, I'm going to give it to you. Keep walking. Keep on walking. Walk in faith. But walk in dominion. Jesus paid the price. I believe he wants the world to be uh, under the domain of righteous people and not the unrighteous. Amen? Amen. The last thing that we looked at here. Uh, they pierced his side and, and forthwith come blood and, and water from Jesus' side. And you know, I believe that does attest to the fact that he heals brokenhearted. As he said over there in Luke chapter 4, that he came to heal the brokenhearted. Amen. And you know, when, when God heals a broken heart, he restores the joy of the Lord into you. Amen. That's how it works, church. So if we're lacking in any of these areas, we've just done a quick summary here of how we can discern the Lord's body when we take communion because He said, you know, this bread's my body and this wine's my blood. Amen. Let it work for you just that way. Amen. And let me tell you something else. As we take communion, we are developing a relationship with our Heavenly Father <clears throat> that I don't know any other way you could be any more intimate with Him than when you take the communion the way God wants us to. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord.